Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Nowy's Dive Team Report. I'm your host, Greg Martin. Now, I have to tell you from the onset that I'm especially excited about today's guest on the Nowy Dive Team Report, since as a youngster, I was always fascinated with anything related to the oceans and diving, and one of the highlights was the January 23rd, 1960 descent of the Bathyscaphe Trieste to the depths of the ocean, and in fact, the deepest known location on the planet, the Challenger Deep. It was something the Navy called Project Necton, and on board the Trieste was the son of the Trieste designer, Jacques Picard, and one U.S. Navy Lieutenant, Don Walsh, who joins us on the Nowy Podcast. Other kids growing up, you know, had heroes like John Wayne and so forth, and I had people like Jacques Picard and Don Walsh to be heroes. Wow, that's very flattering. So how did you get involved with Project Necton? Well, I was serving in submarines in San Diego. I had... uh just qualified, got my dolphins, and uh, the Navy had purchased this thing. This is 1958, and the Navy just purchased the Trieste and brought it over from Italy to San Diego, and it was was a major Navy undersea laboratory there. It was Naval Electronics Laboratory at that time, but Undersea Systems Command or something like that today. And they had a really great great staff of oceanographers, so great program there. One of the big things at that, at that time in those years was bioacoustics, trying to fingerprint all of the noise in the oceans. That, uh, you know, they put out a request for uh, volunteers to join this new program because the, the, the Navy R&D types figured, well, you know, the closest job description of Bathyscaphe pilots probably a submarine person. So they wanted two officers and about five enlisted to basically maintain and run the the Baptist Gap. The actual programs, uh, you know, what what would be projects would be done by the people, the scientists at the lab, but we would take care of it. So we're kind of like a boat crew. And so I put my hand up and uh, I passed the Navy's really high standards for Baptist Gap pilot, uh, rigorous as they were. Uh, because I was the only volunteer. <laughs> then I had to find another guy to work with me. I went to the Naval Academy, and my bachelor's degree is in engineering. So uh, this thing is pretty simple, the Trieste, the Bathyscaphe. It was different, but from a technical point of view, pretty simple. And so I joined the program in January of 59, and 12 months later, you know, I was in the bottom of the deepest place in the ocean. During the, that year, we just made increasingly deeper test dives and learned the vagaries of the of the Baptist Gap, what was a normal sound, and if it wasn't that, then what could it be if it's an abnormal sound, and uh, how it worked and all the bits and pieces. And it, it's like um, being a test pilot on a new airplane. You just check everything you can. You go through a mental checklist of if this happens, then I do this or that. You're pretty much on your game on every dive. And succeedingly deeper dives, we were able to pretty much um, get it up and ready. And and, uh, we had a lot of confidence uh, in it by the time we did the deep dive. I always found it fascinating because uh, the the Trieste, basically, I mean, it wasn't technically a submarine. You you didn't really have any propulsion. It just was basically up and down, right? Yeah. Well, it's a vertical probe, and it requires the surface support vessels. Uh, It's an underwater balloon. I mean, it's not tethered to the surface or anything like that. It's it's free swimming. But, no, it's not a submarine. Your your dives, uh, I think, in later years... Remember, the U.S. Navy operated bathyscaphe for 25 years, a quarter of a century. That was the primary way of getting people into the deepest part of the ocean. I was only with, of course, the first three and a half years. But uh, it was pretty simple in concept. It was a balloon. People often ask me, were you afraid? And I say, no, I'd, because if you, if you allow fear to creep in, you lose a lot of your mental acuity. You're certainly on your game. I mean, you're very alert. But uh, if you're kind of frightened, you get paralyzed by fear, and then things can happen. So you have to be very professional, and you have to be very prepared. And we were very prepared. We, as I said, we did uh, progressively deeper test dives for some months before we ever tried the deep dive. Did I understand that uh, one of the portholes cracked at one point? It was not a pressure boundary. It was a, view, uh, a uh, window, and so the sea pressure on both sides is exactly the same. But uh, we'd never had something like that happen. It happened to us about 30,000 feet. And, uh, you know, we checked all the gauges and everything. And 
everything was fine. Uh, all the readings were good. They were progressing nicely, so we just decided that whatever it was, it wasn't mission limiting, and we just went on ahead and went on down to 35,000 feet. Let me ask you this, Don. Besides becoming the first and almost the only human beings to reach what we consider the bottom of the ocean, I guess we've proven that it's the bottom of the ocean, what do you consider the most significant achievement of this whole thing? To go back to what I implied uh, or inferred earlier, uh, Jacques Picard and I were test pilots. We were not oceanographers. We were Our job was to test this thing to make sure it was a safe and productive platform for marine scientists. I mean, the Office of Naval Research bought, after due consideration, bought the Trieste from the Picards in January uh, 58 to uh, use it as a way of getting researchers into the deep ocean, uh, as we call in situ research, which means nothing more than taking the trained mind and the trained eye into the inside the ocean. That's particularly powerful for the sort of the observational um, sciences involved in oceanography, and that would be marine geology and marine biology, where looking out and seeing things uh, is important. Uh, you know, chemical oceanography or physical oceanography, which is my field, uh, looking at the ocean doesn't increase your knowledge very much because you can't see chemistry, if you will. Uh, you can't see physical oceanography, that is the motions of the oceans in the sense of uh, doing fine-grained research. But for geology and biology, it was very important. And, and since oceanography began as kind of a formal group of sciences uh, in the late 1800s, around 1870, I think, uh, which was the first the Challenger expedition, you always did it from on the other side of the interface, sitting on a ship, then lowering things into the ocean that you know, take up samples, later cameras, artificial eyes, uh, artificial hands in the uh, form of grab samplers and cores and so on. But you really never were there where the sample was taken. And that's like a geologist, you know, getting some guy uh, in a freshman geology class and giving him the keys to your Jeep and saying, well, go out in the desert and get a few rocks for me and bring them back. And then you write a learned paper about those few rocks. You've got to be there. But Jacques and I were test pilots. We were testing it to the ultimate depth, which was the deepest place in the ocean. The idea was that it could go anywhere in the world ocean safely and come back up, and it could do work. So our job was, well, it's kind of like when Boeing builds a new airplane, they don't roll it over the passenger terminal and load the passengers. They, you have a test program. You fly it around for a while and make sure everything's ready. And that's what we did uh, before it was handed over to the marine scientists. To, uh, to use as a platform. Uh, and, of course, that came back to bite us a little bit in that just before we landed, uh, we spotted a fish on the seafloor. Uh, it was about a foot long, a flat fish, like a sole or a flounder. And uh, we noted that. And, of course, we got poo-pooed by all the ichthyologists, marine biologists, saying, well, you know, they didn't see a fish. Well, I always thought I at least knew from a primitive point of view as a biologist, uh, well, what a fish looks what like. What a fish will look like. <laughs> and this is a, it told us three things, that just that quick glimpse. Uh, that's a high-order marine vertebrate. Notice it's, it's a vertebrate like you and me, so it's a very high order of marine life. It's bottom-dwelling. They'd lived there the whole time, so it wasn't just somebody on a business trip. And if there's one, there's two. There's more. And there's food and uh, everything required to support life down that deep. And so for, what, 56 years, we've been living under that, well, Jacques died in uh, November 2009, or 8, somewhere around there, that uh, we didn't see what we saw. However, I think in the last four months or so, uh, quite proper marine biologists, well-qualified, trained, know what they see, have seen uh, a vertebrate fish down to, I think, around 30,000 feet. So if I live long enough, they may even find one at the bottom of Challenger Deep. In fact, that was the imperative I gave to Jim uh, when he made his dive in, in March of 12. I was the last person to talk to him. I said, okay, Jim, now have fun and find that damn fish. <laughs> of course, you're talking about James Cameron and the Deep Sea Challenger. Yeah. So you, you were a part of that program oh, yeah. with him? 
I have this feeling, and and I don't want to sound you know negative in any way, but I have this feeling that uh, that history needs to pay more attention to this particular incident and the the Trieste. I mean, we we hear all about the space vehicles that go up. We know we can remember the Friendship Seven, and of course all of the uh, shuttle ships that have gone up. But very rarely do we ever hear you know about the Trieste. And would would you would you feel like you know maybe history should be a little kinder there? Uh, that's hard for me. I mean, I'm inside all of this, uh, and, and to, uh, I don't have the proper perspective. I, I, I think as a, uh, incentive for young people, uh, to be interested in the oceans on, uh, you know, I've, I've strong feelings about that. The, uh, here we are on this manned satellite called planet earth. And we really do need a mission to planet earth. I, I it's very nice. We're going to put people back on the moon and, fire some off to Mars another decade or so, but with 90% or 85% of the world ocean unexplored, I'd suggest that most of us have to stay here on this satellite, and it'd be good to know how it works. So things like the dress might inspire youngsters to, because uh, there's an adventure story there and all that kind of stuff plays well, and once you got their attention, then you can sort of deliver a message from the sponsor, because really today... If you want to make your mark on the world, get into the ocean business, that is, as a scientist, because there's so much that's not been explored or known yet, you can put your name on all kinds of discoveries, because we just don't know what's down there. Well, I do have to say thank you. Thank you for that trip that you made all those years ago, because it's inspired a, a lot of people, and I appreciate the fact that uh, you've given me some time to to talk about those things and uh, some insight on, you know, how you feel about the oceans. And do you have any, any words, final words for, uh, for the young people out there? Sure. Come on in. The water's fine. I hope that in the future, history will pay a lot more attention to this event. And that's this episode of Nowey's Dive Team Report. I'm Greg Martin. Thanks for listening. I'll see you underwater.